Okay, we are live on YouTube and on the leftberlin.com. Um, we'll just wait a couple of minutes for people to get going. Um, my name is Phil Butland. I'm one of the chairs of the meeting. Um, Hossam, you can see in front of you, uh, Egyptian, um, uh, Egyptian activist and journalist. Um, as I said, we'll just sort of, just so that you know you're in the right place, um, we'll start in a couple of minutes. Maybe while we're waiting, so the other chair is going to be Hannah. Maybe, Hannah, you can introduce yourself as well. Yeah, hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, my name is Hannah uh, Kalaj I am the second speaker of d Internationals as of um, a month ago. And, uh, yeah, we're very pleased tonight to have Hossam Mohamalawi with us. So uh, I think we'll start properly in a minute, but uh, as we're waiting for people to join us. <laughs> Um, maybe while we're waiting, Hossam, are there any campaigns that you want people to know about that are going on? Um, sure, there are um, uh, several campaigns uh, that are happening in solidarity with the Egyptian detainees uh, at this point. Uh, one is here in uh, Germany, uh, whereby uh, some parliamentarians from uh, Die Linke <clears throat> had already uh, signed uh, a solidarity uh, letter uh, calling on the German state to cease security cooperation with uh, the CC regime. Uh, there are also, I mean, similar campaigns um, uh, happening in Britain and the US and elsewhere. So maybe also after uh, this event is over, we will post on the wall uh, of the event some URLs for anyone who's trying to um, get involved and uh, help us out. Great, we can definitely do that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the um, this is event is on. Um, there's an event on the leftberlin.com. There's also an event on our Facebook page, and we'll publish all the necessary information there. Um, I think we can start. We can slowly start to get going, Hannah. Yes. So um, to those of you that have just joined us, uh, welcome to. Uh, our event tonight. Um, we are D-Linker Internationals or the working group of D-Linker um, in Berlin um, and today we're going to be talking about the, well it's 10 years since the North African revolutions and we are very honoured and pleased that tonight we have um, Hossam Hamlawi with us um, to tell you about what was happening at the time and what's going on now. Um, and Hossam is a journalist, a photographer, and an activist with the Egyptian Revolutionary Socialists. He was among the Jan 25 organizers and continues to report dissent at arabawi.org. Um, and we are really, very really pleased that he has been able to take the time to uh, talk to us about what's going on and what's been happening, um, because of course, there's not been as much um, coverage of what's going on in Egypt in the last few years, but luckily we're able to talk about it again now that um, we had the 10th anniversary of uh, the so-called Arab, Arab Spring and that um, we're going to jump in straight with questions and that actually leads me to my first question, uh, or our first question, which is um, if you could tell us, Hossam, how accurate you actually find the term Arab Spring as a description of what happened 10 years ago. Uh, hello, Hannah, and uh, thanks again for uh, having me um, uh, in this event and giving me a platform to speak. Uh, regarding your question, um, I use the term only out of convenience because that's the popular term and uh, usually when you say it, everyone knows what you're referring to. But to be honest, it's not that accurate um, because the term Arab Spring uh, does not engulf completely uh, all the groups that uh, went on an uprising uh, uh, in 2011. Uh, there were many, uh, the region is full of uh, diverse ethnic and cultural uh, um, minorities and groups and uh, they took part in the revolt and they don't necessarily um, categorize themselves as Arabs um, and on several occasions in the past um, the idea of Arabism was used against them um, in in one form or or another in order to achieve some sort of a racist 
uh, social control um, in their societies. Um, so, <clears throat> for example, I mean, we have the Kurds. Uh, the Kurds are not Arabs, uh, but they were part of um, uh, that uh, wave of revolt. So I usually refer to it as regional uprisings, the 2011 first wave of Middle Eastern uprisings. Um, but I don't use the term that much except like out of convenience. Great. So, I mean, oh, sorry, Phil, go ahead. No, please. <laughs> no, I was going to say that um, that's really very interesting. And actually, you already touched on the fact that there were so many groups that took part in this uprising at the time. And um, but maybe we can kind of go into directly your experience of what happened 10 years ago, because I know you were there and you're reporting from Tahir Square. So maybe you could talk to us a bit about the background and your personal experience. Uh, I've been involved in the Egyptian uh, opposition since I was uh, a student uh, in my undergraduate years. Um, I joined the Egyptian Revolutionary Socialists in 1998 when I was at my third year at university. So I've been involved in, in the dissident scene for, um, for a long time before the revolt. Um, and I consider myself uh, to be fortunate uh, because I saw uh, incrementally how dissent was accumulating and, and how the road to, to revolt was being paved years in advance um, when everyone back then thought that you were crazy to talk about uh, some form of collective mass action in the future. Uh, by, two, by January 2011, uh, around the time of the uprising, um, there was some contradictory general feeling. I mean, on the one hand, anyone could feel that Egypt was heading for an explosion. Um, I, I, I already had several blog posts in 2010, for example, where I was talking about the future and... Uh, the summary, you know, I mean, of what I what I wrote, so as not to take a long time, is that basically we're heading for an uprising, and this does not necessarily um, um, happen because, like, I I could see into the future, but I think this was a general observation of anyone who lived in Egypt at the time. You had strikes in literally every single sector in Egyptian society you had wide disillusionment uh, with the regime's uh, economic policies. Um, in, I mean, in Egypt, we went on an aggressive neoliberal uh, program starting from 1991, 1992. And by the time of the uprising, although Egypt was being celebrated as a success model uh, uh, for the IMF and the World Bank, the situation on the ground was definitely in a much horrible status. Um, and impoverishment and, and class polarization were accelerating. Um, there was also a, a wide um, sense of anger vis-a-vis -vis the police uh, in Egypt. Um, Egypt is a police state. That's, not, uh, that's hardly news. Um, but I don't think that non-Egyptians at the time understood the level of brutality uh, that the police was involved in in, in micromanaging the daily affairs of the Egyptians. Um, the stereotype, uh, you know, of, of police violence usually is that, you know, police is violent towards political activists. But you will be surprised that this is not necessarily always the case. Um, at least in the case of the political activists, sometimes the police put some considerations that, Oh, these guys are like uh, experienced and they might, after uh, uh, they leave custody, they're going to speak about it. They're going to make a fuss about it. They're going to expose what's happening, blah, blah, blah. So actually the police on, on some occasions used to treat us a little bit leniently, uh, but not always. Um, but in the case of the average Egyptian citizen on a daily basis, uh, it was a very, hu any contact with the police was extremely humiliating. And the way that Mubarak policed the country was very similar to a foreign uh, uh, occupation army engaged in pacifying the local population. 
you used to have uh, police cars that would go on patrol at night uh, in working class neighborhoods and in the neighborhoods of the urban poor. And then they, they would pick uh, young men, you know, I mean, randomly uh, rough them up, beat them up. Uh, uh, if they have any unsolved crimes, you know, they can just like randomly choose people and give them, you know, I mean, those uh, accusations and fabricate charges against them. They used to impose royalty like any uh, uh, gang cartel, basically. Um, so the police uh, was another reason that there was wide anger uh, uh, in the public. All of these factors were basically getting together. And in the midst of this, the revolution happened in Tunisia. And it was aired live to millions of Egyptians in their homes. And this kind of um, basically put out a simple message. It's not crazy to have a revolution. Revolutions work. Um, your Arab dictators are not invincible. And look at Ben Ali, he's been toppled. So if the Tunisians can topple uh, uh, Ben Ali, then we can topple Mubarak too. And this was uh, among the sparks uh, 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 that led to the January revolt. It might have longer roots, but definitely the uprising in Tunisia was, was the spark for ours. Um, before the next question, just to anybody watching this on the leftberlin.com, you can ask questions. There's a button bottom right saying, ask a question. If you send it in, we'll try and put them to Hossam. Um, I just want to ask Hossam next, who was it who made the revolution? You some reading some of the western reports you get the idea a couple of people sat on facebook uh they typed some things in and suddenly there were two million people in Tahrir square but what what was it that moved from this general state of repression to 25th of january and beyond um in the run-up to the january 25th um, um uh, protests there were several organizational uh, meetings that took place in order to coordinate the actions on that day. Uh, the revolution was not um, largely spontaneous. Spontaneity is one factor in, in any political action. and uh, uh, But at the same time, um, in order to have a successful uh, uprising, you need some level of organization and coordination. Uh, spontaneity is not enough. And in the case of the January Revolution, uh, to be specific, since that's what we're talking about tonight, there were several coordinating meetings between the political uh, uh, Egyptian opposition forces of all streams except Islamists. The Islamists were not uh, uh, initial participants uh, in the uprising. And actually, the Muslim Brotherhood leadership um, prior to January 25th, had declared that they are not uh, going to take part uh, uh, in the protests. But other organizers from the uh, left-wing groups, uh, including my group, the Egyptian Revolutionary Socialists, uh, as well as Nasserists, and as well as other uh, political factions, we got together, we, we agreed on a set of demands. Um, the highest ceiling at the time in the beginning was not the overthrow of the regime, but it was simply the impeachment of the interior minister, Habib al-Adli, um, as well as um, uh, the demand for stopping immediately police torture and investigating uh, torture cases. But as, um, as the event progressed, uh, spontaneity played a role, and the, the reaction of the Egyptian people to the calls of the protests on January 25th uh, took everyone by surprise, including the organizers themselves. Um, I remember on that day, um, um, I, I was playing a logistical role, basically. I was among the army of uh, Egyptian bloggers who were tasked with disseminating those visuals uh, of the protests and updates to the widest uh, uh, circle possible uh, among local and international uh, journalists and activists. So um, after the police dispersed uh, brutally, like the first wave of protests, uh, by the evening when, when I started receiving phone calls from uh, colleagues, like saying, 
حسام there is one million people in Tahrir Square. I I was like, you know, I mean, uh, are you out of your mind? Are you smoking something? I mean, this can be like, what do you, what I what do you mean? I mean, I know activists are usually in the habit of inflating numbers, but you know, not to that extent. Come on. And they were like, no, there is roughly at, at least half a million people in Tahrir Square. And when the visuals started coming in, I was like, oh my God, this is biggest, this is bigger than anything I've ever seen in my whole life in Egypt um, uh, at the time. And if we manage to sustain the mobilization, uh, at least till Friday, three days later, I meant, um, then we can start talking about a serious, uh, uh, overthrow of the regime is underway. So you say it was a surprise to how many people turned up. So can you tell us a bit about how it came to the fact that so many people did turn up on that particular day? Um, it might sound uh, very simplistic now, you know, when I say that, um, oh, there was a call for protests, uh, some people showed up and then suddenly it snowballed. Um, this might sound like, you know, I mean, uh, very simple, and it was that simple. But I think the complications um, or the other side of the story that tells you how complicated was, the, was that process is if you go back in time, for example, in the 1990s or the beginning of the 2000s, and you would tell someone, uh, let's have a protest against Hosni Mubarak, he would tell you that you're mad. Um, this would be something extremely suicidal. In the 1990s, Egypt was going through a dirty war um, under the guise of a war on terror, whereby dissent was crushed from all shades, not just the Islamists. Industrial actions were... Um, uh, a rare phenomena, uh, industrial struggles were at their lowest, social struggles were at their lowest, uh, the student movement was confined within the walls of the universities. Once you stepped outside, you were risking being shot uh, by the police. Um, so it, it was a long process of basically dissent and anger accumulating starting from the year 2000 to be more specific that led to the fact that by the time uh, you reach January 25th 2011 the Egyptian public was like a bomb uh, uh, waiting to explode um, they, they, th the fear from the regime had dwindled the fear from the police had uh, uh, dwindled. Uh, disillusionment with Mubarak, you know, was very widespread. And there were also an increasingly, uh, um, uh, like the masses were learning. I mean, the masses were reaching political maturity. All of these struggles that were happening in Egypt in the 10 years prior to the 2011 uprising meant that there was some collective consciousness that that understood slogans that understood how you would organize so even when people started acting spontaneously uh, uh, on that day and throughout the 18 days of the uprising it, that, the, this spontaneity did not come from another universe um, it came from the struggles that they had went through or that they have seen with their own eyes in the years in the run-up to 2011 so that's what brought everyone together uh, uh, in the end during the uprising. Um, can we move on to the role of the Muslim Brotherhood? You said at the beginning the Brotherhood wasn't really part of the organising and indeed it was quite hostile to some of the first actions. And yet very quickly it came to, pre pre came to lead a, uh, play quite a leading role in um, the actions after 25th of January. How did that happen and why? The role of the Muslim Brotherhood was contradictory. And, and this is in general the kind of contradictions that you would expect from the Islamists and you would expect from any political movement that is, um, that is multi-class when it comes to its uh, nature. Um, what do I mean by that? Uh, I mean that the Muslim Brotherhood is not one unified bloc uh, in the end. 
when I was telling you that the leadership did that the Muslim Brotherhood did not endorse initially the call for protests, I made sure to specify that it was the Muslim Brotherhood leadership that did not want to uh, uh, endorse the protests. But from day one, uh, believe it or not, there were young Muslim Brotherhood activists who took part in the protests uh, against the will of their uh, political leaders. And such contradictions in the organizations where the leadership is in one uh, uh, universe while the base cadres are in another universe or on another front um, is a phenomena that has marked the history of Islamism in general. Again, why is that? Um, when you get an organization or a movement uh, whose leadership, they come from the elites, they come from sections of the ruling class at the end of the day. Um, they could be run by uh, billionaires. Uh, they could be run by large uh, landowners who are conservatives. So people like Hayrat Shatter, for, exa for example, who was the main organizer uh, uh, and the political leadership of the group, the real political leadership, and right now he's in prison. Now he's a millionaire. Uh, there were other also businessmen. But if you go down, the bulk of the organization, they come from middle class backgrounds, people who are like doctors, uh, pharmacists, engineers, uh, graduates, clerics. Um, and then they also, at the, at the bottom, uh, they have membership that comes from working class backgrounds, um, peasantry, and some of the urban poor. The Muslim Brotherhood throughout its history was not known to be a working class organization, but they did have uh, some roots uh, in the working class. Now, what does this mean in terms of practice? This means that when the Muslim Brotherhood raises the slogan of we want to implement the Islamic Sharia, for example. Now, slogans are very catchy. And, and, of course, they can mobilize millions around those slogans. But then when you ask them to be a little bit more detailed and explain to us concretely, what do you mean by applying Sharia? Maybe someone like Hayrat Shatter, for him, Sharia would be uh, neoliberal reforms, would be free trade, would be uh, stability and crushing strikes for the sake of uh, uh, the country not devolving into chaos. Um, it, it might mean a package of policies that actually, if you ask um, a base cadre from the Muslim Brotherhood, who might be a factory worker, for example, so you want to apply Sharia, what's Sharia for you? He will answer you back by Sharia is social justice. Sharia is that, you know, I would get job security. Sharia is that I would have decent housing and that my, my, my children would get decent education. Sharia is this and that. He, and he would give you some form of a, a welfare state uh, that is not different really from what social democrats you know, might put forward. Now, this means that at every twist and turn of the Egyptian revolution, and even prior to the revolution, that um, whenever the Muslim Brotherhood took a concrete position regarding a cause or regarding a political uh, uh, event, you always had fractures and, and cracks and splits within the organization because you cannot come up with a political program that would satisfy every single one uh, uh, in the organization. Hence, uh, people like me on the left uh, uh, prior to the revolution uh, we were using, you know, I mean, slogans like, you know, the best way to expose reformists is by putting them in power. Um, and and actually, th throughout this year, when the Muslim Brotherhood uh, had the presidency, I would say this was the year where the biggest splits in the organizations were happening, where the, the Muslim Brotherhood were put in a position where they had to deliver promises, populist promises that they were giving, but instead they were acting in a very neoliberal uh, fashion. So again, the Muslim Brotherhood did not initially endorse the uprising, but their cadres were part of it. Uh, throughout the 18 days until Mubarak uh, stepped down, they were doing a contradictory dual thing. 
their leadership was trying to negotiate a compromise with Hosni Mubarak and with Omar Suleiman, who was his uh, uh, spy chief. But at the same time, their cadres were in Tahrir Square and they defied the orders to suspend the protest at least on one occasion uh, throughout the 18 days. And they fought bravely and heroically uh, uh, throughout uh, the uprising. Now, after Mubarak was toppled, the military and the Islamist forces uh, in general, not just uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, but that will also include uh, most of the Salafis uh, uh, in Egypt, they, they got into some Faustian deal with the military. Like, we will try to keep the streets as calm as possible. We will try to defuse the militancy in the streets as much as possible. And in exchange, we will embark on a political process that will give us what we think is our deserved share of the political cake uh, as the Egyptian uh, uh, opposition. So this meant that the Muslim Brotherhood was attacking strikers uh, um, following the uh, overthrow of Mubarak. It was using anti-revolutionary rhetoric against any mobilizations against the military throughout 2011 uh, and 2012. Um, they, they are the ones who defended the police, for example, uh, when they started attacking us during the November and the December 2011 uh, mini uprisings in what was dubbed as the Muhammad Mahmoud Street uh, uprising. Um, they, it was uh, the late President Morsi himself who appointed Sisi as the Minister of Defense, and he's the one who refused to hold the military generals accountable for their crimes throughout 2011. He's the one who increased the finances of the police forces and, and, and rearmed them again after they were defeated during the uprising. And it's ironically the same arms that they used to massacre uh, his supporters in the end. So as you can see, it was uh, a, a dual kind of uh, a role throughout the uprising. But what is scandalous is the position of most of the left-wing forces uh, during the Egyptian revolution, because the Egyptian Stalinist left, as well as the nationalist left, they have this uh, analysis of Islamism as fascism which is definitely wrong. The Islamists are not fascists. This means that, this does not mean that they are progressive, but fascism distinctively is a social movement with a definite characters and traits that's different from the Muslim Brotherhood. So for them, since these were fascists, they stood by the military counter-revolution in its fight against the Islamists. So the Egyptian left supported the biggest massacres in the history of modern Egypt, uh, uh, which happened in August 2013, because the military was fighting fascism. In the name of confronting fascism, uh, the Egyptian left sections of it also stood by Ahmad Shafiq uh, during the second round of the presidential elections in 2012, when he ran against Mohamed Morsi of the Muslim Brotherhood. So they were willing to go as far as supporting the official representative of the counter-revolution, anything but to get the Islamists uh, uh, in power. So that's, in summary, the role of, of, of Islamism and the role of the other political forces vis-a-vis -vis Islamism throughout the Egyptian uprising. Mm, thank you for that. That was very comprehensive and really fascinating. Um, and actually, you know, you've been talking a lot about um, contradictions and duality just now, and you've also been talking about the armies. So that really leads us really nicely to our first audience question. And I'll just uh, do a little tangent that anybody who's listening, you're very welcome to send in questions and we will put them to Hossam. Um, but the question we have is from Miguel in Berlin, who says, um, did you manage to win any part of the then army to the revolution and was this even possible? Um, th that's a very good question, and I think this is the question that will uh, determine um, in the future uh, the fate of any revolution. Can you win over the army to your side or not? Um, and by winning over the army, I don't mean appeasing the military generals who run the army and who are essentially uh, a part of the ruling regime 
And actually, they are not just part of the ruling regime. They are the last line of defense um, for, for the state uh, uh, in any society. Um, the only reason that the military generals did not nuke us in Tahrir in 2011 was the fact that they were not, um, they were not sure about maintaining the ranks and keeping the loyalty of the young officers and the conscripts if they ordered them to open fire on the protesters. Um, that was the main, that's the number one reason. I know that there are tons of conspiracy theories about how the military actually wanted to get rid of Mubarak. That's why they, they allowed those Tahrir protesters to do their thing. You know, th this is completely untrue. Um, those hand-picked military generals, no matter how dissatisfied they were with Mubarak over X issue or Y issue, they never dreamt of going against him at the end of the day. But the only reason that they did not fire on us throughout the 18 days was the fact that they, they, they did not trust their soldiers to implement those orders. Now, this changed later. Um, it took the army three years to re-establish uh, its control uh, uh, over its ranks, over its military officers, over its uh, ground troops, over its conscripts, so as to be able to relaunch the, 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 attack, the, the real attack against the revolution uh, following the coup in 2013. Although the army, I mean, already before was involved in several attacks on protesters. Um, there, there was at least one reported mutiny at some point uh, throughout those three years until we reached the coup. And when it comes to the ranks of the central security forces, these are the police paramilitaries. That's, that's the army of the interior ministry. And it's the equivalent of the riot troops in, in the West. But in Egypt, they are highly militarized. And since the beginning of the 1970s, uh, they were the main tool for controlling uh, uh, crowds and for crushing uh, dissent in Egypt. But they depend on, on conscripts. They don't depend on like full-time uh, uh, soldiers. So these conscripts actually went on a, several mutinies uh, throughout uh, the revolution. Now, how did revolutionaries relate to this? Um, I don't think that they have related necessarily in, in the correct manner. But at the same time, there wasn't much to be done. And I will explain myself. Um, on the one hand, there were sections of the Egyptian opposition that got completely freaked out by the prospects that the army might split or, or that mutinies might happen. And so they, from the start, were for preserving the army as an institution uh, that is completely solid and, and with no fractures. How are they going to do that while Mubarak's generals are, are on top of it? You know, they had all of these naive ideas that they could give them safe exit, that uh, maybe we will compromise with, you know, some of their privileges, but we'll keep the army as it is. And of course, you know, we see how, how where did this uh, uh, take us uh, in the end? But on the one hand, even revolutionary radicals, uh, including myself and, and others on the left, in order to be able to relate to those conscripts, you have to be big enough to, to present them with, with an alternative. Uh, a soldier might be disillusioned with his command. Uh, a soldier might be dissatisfied with the orders he's given, but he's not going to simply lay down his weapons and, and join the protesters unless the protesters can protect him, unless the protesters can provide him with an umbrella that can shield him from the wrath uh, of the army. If he would feel that if he crosses over to the other side, that the other side is winning. These are things that, um, I mean, it's one thing to read about a revolution and it's another thing to be in the midst of a revolution. And you have to always keep on trying to um, 
evaluate and judge the psyche and and the mood of the masses and 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 the mood of your enemies as you are dealing with them so i hope this answers your question somehow i mean this can take us um tons of hours and and volumes of books you know i mean to to write about and read about but i i try to be as um, um as brief as possible thanks Hossam. the next question is from Talia in the UK. Now, I'll do this in two parts because there's quite a lot for you to get your teeth into. The first is about the Egyptian diaspora. Uh, Talia says, many thanks, Hossam and Left Berlin, for this rich and thought-provoking account of the Egyptian uprising. I'm interested in hearing your thoughts regarding the possibilities of an emerging political alternative in Egypt, given the unprecedented, unprecedented consolidation of authoritarian power and the absence of the generation that developed first-hand political experience pre and post-2011 due to t detention or forced exile. I would also appreciate your thoughts on whether and or how Egyptian diaspora can contribute structurally to forms of political change in Egypt. Um, you know, I'll, I will repeat what I always say, you know, um, when counter-revolutions are victorious, they they don't take you back to square one. They take you back to square zero or even below zero. Things do not return to what they were on the eve of uh, a revolution. So um, what, um, uh, what our comrade here has asked is, is definitely a spot on uh, question. Uh, the regime or the counter-revolutionary regime in Egypt has consolidated power um, and has shut down any margin and any public free space uh, where you can organize. Uh, independent unions have been crushed, political parties are besieged, um, 19 new prisons at least have been built since uh, uh, the coup up until today to house tens of thousands of political prisoners, or at least 60,000 political prisoners, according to the estimates of local and international uh, rights watchdogs. Um, most of the community organizers, uh, youth uh, revolutionary movements, all of this has been crushed. Uh, but things cannot continue like this forever. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that on the one hand, there are spontaneous protests that are happening every now and then, here and there. I mean, the protests have not stopped um, uh, since the coup. But they are usually protests that do not involve uh, political actors. Um, they are spontaneous protests over gentrification, housing issues, um, wildcat strikes from uh, state enterprises that are about to be liquidated or privatized. Um, and, and, you know, these like little struggles are erupting here and there. Uh, what, in my view, the revival of, of the Egyptian revolutionary um, uh, upheavals or the revival of street politics will have to go hand in hand with rebuilding what has been destroyed from uh, the political structures uh, uh, of the Egyptian dissident community because it's those structures that can sustain a mobilization for long periods of time and it's those structures that will be able to translate the spontaneity uh, of the masses into articulating political demands and, and political programs and provide a viable alternative to the regime. This, um, this is not going to happen anytime soon, I'm afraid. Um, I, I have to be very, very realistic about how bleak the situation is. But I am for, try for trying to push the, the, the ceiling and, and to push the red lines bit by bit, by united fronts with very low ceilings that do not necessarily call for the overthrowing of the military regime right now, but to have smaller fights to try to gain a little bit of a political margin, where in the future you can start mobilizing and, and getting more active uh, in that margin that you will win bit by bit. And on the other hand, the Egyptians in the diaspora uh, will have to play a bigger role, uh, uh, obviously, than the ones uh, back home in the current time. 
uh, until the balance of forces start to change uh, in the future. What can Egyptians in the diaspora do? They can do many things. I mean, the number one priority, of course, uh, uh, is the solidarity campaigns with the Egyptian detainees. Um, it's not uh, a secret that, you know, there are draconian restrictions over the freedom of expression, the freedom of speech in Egypt now. And social media users, journalists, bloggers, I mean, everyone is targeted. So at least we can be their voice uh, 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 for now, where we can um, disseminate information about the detainees, where we can make so much noise as much as possible uh, on social media and among the local media in the countries where we are currently based. So here, for example, if I'm in Germany, I should try to raise the issue of Egypt as much as I can within the German uh, uh, media establishment and among the political circles. And um, in addition to that is to try to lobby uh, your governments respectively where in, in the countries where you're currently residing in exile into stopping as much as possible the military and the security cooperation with the Sisi regime. Um, these, these two things, at least they are campaigns that are like very natural, you know, I mean, uh, things to do uh, in the beginning. And from these campaigns in the future, we can start developing some united fronts that can present a different uh, um, political alternative to the regime. I know there has been already several initiatives in the past, but in general, it's... It, I find them more of, I'm not trying to dismiss them, but it's it's almost a circus. It's not uh, because there is nothing really that you can do back home uh, uh, at the moment. There isn't any space for you to move. And the opposition abroad has been doing all of these chaotic uh, uh, calls for strikes and protests and uprisings, things that did not deliver and will not deliver anytime soon. Um, so there isn't anything that's concretely alter viable uh, 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 as an alternative at the moment. But I believe this will evolve out of the campaigns that we are currently involved in. Okay, you've slightly anticipated Talia's um, final question, which is, how do you see the current wave of labor mobilization in Egypt? Um, it is, of course, different from the years uh, 2006 till 2011. Um, these were the years uh, that preceded the January uprising. And um, these were the years that uh, the labor movement was being revived. And you feel that it was gaining ground. It was spreading. It was much more optimistic and hopeful and much more confident that they will achieve victory uh, uh, over the different campaigns that they were involved in. The current struggles that are taking place in Egypt, um, I mean, there are several uh, strikes and, and labor protests that are happening, by the way, uh, as I'm speaking. I mean, there was the one in Talha, which is located in the Dakahleya province in the Nile Delta, where, for example, workers were striking against um, um, the privatization of the firm and its liquidation. Uh, another strike was happening in Hilwan, uh, where our in, our famous uh, steel mills uh, that enjoyed an iconic status uh, in Egyptian um, political culture as well as in the as well as in the labor movement. Now they were being uh, liquidated, so the workers were going on strike uh, against it. These are more or less like desperate struggles to try to defend whatever gains uh, left or whatever minimum uh, uh, rights left. It's different from the kind of struggles in the past where you are actually going on an offense, uh, uh, trying to gain more rights uh, that are, of course, well-deserved uh, uh, for the workers. So more or less, it is... Um, it is, of course, a, a positive uh, sign that the labor movement is trying to, to fight back as much as possible. But at the same time, it's a very depressing scene um, whereby independent unions have been crushed already, where um, 
the labor activist networks have been you know decimated uh, uh, a long time ago and the the strikes that are happening are not the kind of strikes where you can uh, go to other factories and try to agitate the workers into uh, going on solidarity industrial actions. I mean, it is a time of retreat. Uh, now, will this continue forever? No, I believe not. Um, the, the struggle always goes through cycles where you have an industrial upturn and then an industrial downturn, industrial upturn, industrial downturn. Um, and the same also would go for social struggles and everything else. So I, I think people like myself and like, you know, uh, the comrade who asked the question or any of the viewers, we should try to do our best to publicize uh, the strikes that are happening in Egypt to try to gear up solidarity, uh, um, uh, solidarity letters and solidarity statements from international trade unions, for example, with the struggle. But we have to be realistic about the ceiling that those strikes have so as not to take any miscalculated moves uh, uh, about the, the potential uh, in front of us. These are very risky times. Um, this is a very paranoid and a counter-revolutionary regime. And one miscalculation can lead to very drastic uh, results in terms of people's lives. So we have to be a little bit cautious when we are organizing. Um, thank you so much for that very in-depth answer. That was very interesting, uh, both hopeful and scary. <laughs> um, um, I, I have a question, you know, you've talked a lot about the role of many different groups and kind of the role and position within the what happened 10 years ago and what's been, hap and what's been happening since then. And um, we haven't really heard much about the role of women. So I wondered if you could say a bit more about that. Um, it's not uh, a secret, of course, that Egypt is a very sexist country uh, where women are um, in a very uh, uh, discriminated and marginalized uh, status in general. Um, Egypt is one of the most notorious countries where there is sexual harassment, uh, for example, for women in the streets. But this was also weaponized uh, against political dissidents years before the revolution. For example, uh, on the 25th of May 2005, the regime of Hosni Mubarak organized uh, sex assaults against women protesters and women journalists. Uh, in downtown Cairo in broad daylight uh, on a day where there was a constitutional referendum. And this started a trend among the security services to use that weapon um, uh, very much. But despite um, the sexism and despite the sexual, uh, the, the sexual harassment and, and all the other problems facing Egyptian women, if you look at the strike wave in, in the years in the run-up to the revolution, you will find that women uh, played a central role in the strike wave. Actually, the strike wave itself was uh, initiated by 3,000 female government workers who went on strike in December 2006 in the city of Mahalla, which is located in the heart of the Nile Delta. And they, uh, they struck over, um, I mean, some unfulfilled government promises of paying like bonuses. It was a bread and butter issue. But they started to chant, um, uh, where, where are the men? Here we are, the women. And they shamed their male colleagues into action. Um, and that's when the entire uh, textile mill went on strike. And, and after it won, it triggered the winter of labor discontent, uh, where mass strikes were happening in the textile sector, in the transport sector, in the aviation. I mean, everywhere uh, uh, there were strikes. So, um, so as you can see, the gender, the gender uh, uh, roles were being challenged already uh, in the years in the run-up to the revolution. Throughout the 18 days, I mean, women were part of, of, of the Tahrir protesters. Uh, they were part of the Tahrir sit-in. They were part of the human shields that, were, um, that slept in front of the army tanks to prevent them from uh, suspending uh, the protests. But this does not mean that their situation suddenly became rosy uh, after the toppling of Mubarak. Because 
Um, for example, the first uh, uh, women's march that was organized on the 8th of March uh, 2011, uh, the, the march was mobbed uh, uh, by conservative uh, members of the public. Uh, 